Alex. How are you all? Warm? <laughs> it's quite cool, isn't it? Okay. So, we're going to talk about regenerative agriculture and what it means, but before we can understand what regenerative agriculture is, we must first understand the background from which it came. So then how do we define agriculture? So when we're thinking about agriculture and its definitions, I quite like the definition posed by Miriam, ba ba Miriam Webster's dictionary. It is a science, it is based in science, but practising ag agriculture is also an art in itself. Having knowledge is one thing, but putting it into practice daily requires creativity, skill and understanding. And it's from these things that art derives. I bet you farmers never thought of yourselves as artists. Artists create things of beauty, and in my mind, so do farmers. As we've seen when defining agriculture, it's clearly a noun or a thing that is tangible. But the same cannot be said for the word regenerate. To regenerate is an act of doing. It's a verb. Whoa, what happened there? <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so this is important to understand because unlike a noun, agriculture, which is used to describe many aspects of farming, to regenerate is to make new or to restore. In fact, dictionaries don't even agree completely on the definition. Merriam-Webster gives us restore to a better, higher or worthy state, a more worthy state. Dictionary.com stated, to effect a complete moral reform, while Cambridge implores us to improve a place or system, making it more active or successful. One thing is common amongst these definitions though, and that is to regenerate involves renewal, recreation, and improvement. So what happens when we combine these two words? As we've discussed, to regenerate is to restore. But what exactly are we restoring and why? If our farmers are artists and our agricultural practices are to be regenerative in nature, it goes to our understanding that the nature of our farming and agricultural practices should be recreating and renewing. Our agricultural lands should be restored and regenerated or improved through our management, not devalued or denuded. So regenerative agriculture is greater than the sum of its parts. It builds on what is now, what there is now for the future, and increases in health and beauty over time. Remember I said farmers are artists. Artists seek to create beauty, so I assert to you now that regenerate, regenerative agriculture creates beauty. Without beauty, there can be no regeneration. Humans have been farming the land for over, uh, over 100,000 years, from humble beginnings of gathering and hunting to actively con cultivating grains and domestic domesticating animals. We've relied on the land and her bounty for our existence since time began. Our modern farming methods have really only developed in the last 200 years, with the advent of machinery to assist us with tasks that used to take a village to manage. We've migrated to the cities only when our food systems were able to supply us with the, our needs. Did you know approximately 60% of Earth's arable land is farmed not under what we would call conventional agriculture, but by subsistence farmers? a practice that um, satisfies families' needs and local needs alone, with little left over for transport elsewhere. It is intensively practised in large areas of Southeast Asia and the monsoon areas, and an estimated 2.5 billion subsistence farmers work their lands and continue to do so today. Around the time of the American Revolution, 90% of the population were farmers. Today, only 3% in the US are employed on a farm, and 2% of farms in the US produce 70% of all the domestic vegetables. So how did we get here? 
The first significant inflection point for the agrarian economy came from the Industrial Revolution around 1850, which brought with it the use of machinery to increase productivity and reduce labour. Farmers began to use fertilisers, often in the form of or natural organic material like animal waste and manure, and learned to rotate crops to achieve better soil productivity. When the 1930s and the late 1960s, the Green Revolution accelerated new methods and technologies that increased agricultural production worldwide, including the transition from animal to mechanical power. The increase the increase, the use of chemical fertilisers, agrochemicals, synthetic pesticides and single cropping practices. The rapid industrialisation of agriculture during this period required farmers to become more efficient to remain competitive. It resulted in small farms which had historically grown a wide variety of crops being pushed out by large, larger corporate farms specialising in large scale monocultures of single high yielding crops. These corporate farms were able to produce large quantities of food more, efficient, more efficiently to feed a growing population. Many of the earliest pesticides were simply based on dried plant leaves. One product, sorry, one product familiar to many gardeners, pyrethrum, is based on a plant derived from the chrysanthemum flower, based on organic compounds, sorry. And it was used by Persians as early as 400 BC. Beginning in the 1940s, chemists and chemical companies started to more widely utilise organic chemistry and synthesise and commercialise pesticide products. Many of these were broad spectrum which initially proved to be spectacularly effective compared to what was previously available. High, level, high levels of residual toxic, toxicity and the indiscriminate use of many of these broad spectrum first generation pesticides resulted in significant harm to both the environment and human health. So you'll see the DDT is good for me. That's an actual um, advertising thing that was getting around at the time. Anyway, um, broad spectrum insecticides such as DDT were released for wide, widespread use, despite initially proving to be of great benefit for pest control. The cautionary tale um, of DDT is well known owing in large part to the 1962 publication Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, which documented both the ecolog ecological devastation due to caused by this lovely product and the problems emerging due to its widespread evolution of insect, incest, insect pest resistance. Its legacy continues to be unearthed to this day. Not only do these agrochemicals kill the target pest or disease, but increasingly we've become aware of their other side effects. Um, waterways being sprayed and polluted with this chemical. And as consumers, we're convinced by marketing, we were not only safe, but these chemicals were good for us and our health. Children were routinely sprayed to prevent polio. That didn't work. Um, it was used as an anti-lice powder for those coming out of concentration camps, travelling from overseas, that sort of thing, and the military. It was even plastered on the walls of our kids' bedrooms, which just blew me away. That's um, DDT on the wallpaper. Good stuff. <laughs> um, this insidious marketing went on for years until Rachel Carson's book, raise pub, public awareness of the issues behind the t these types of chemicals and the US Environmental Protection Agency was set up and called for the removal of its use in 1972. But with the removal of DDT from, the le from use, there needed to be a replacement. Around this time, Monsanto released glyphosate, or Roundup, with fanfare of claims. This chemical has now been in use 
around the world for more than 50 years. It is now the most used herbicide in the world. It is sprayed. It's given rise to genetic modification of plant material to resist glyphosate spraying of, we of weeds in crops grown in almost every Western country in the world. It is now known to be a probable carcinogen, one of the most insidious chemicals of our time. Being found in waterways, drinking water, rain, and on fresh food, and even in breast milk. Now there's more and more research detailing the effects of glyphosate on the human body, including being an endocrine disruptor. An endocrine system disruption may cause diabetes, kidney disease, osteoporosis, Cushing's, infertility, and a ho whole host of other dysfunctions. This chemical is so widely used globally that the University of Sydney created this map on toxicities in the soil. There are very few countries in the world that are not using this chemical. The evidence is growing that this chemical is having a massive impact on global health from humans all the way to soil microorganisms. But where to from here, and what does this have to do with regenerative agriculture? Regeneration creates beauty, remember? Where there's beauty, there is... Where is the beauty in dead and lifeless soils? Fields as far as the eye can see of monoculture. The organic industry has since the 1990s been trying to show us how good real food tastes without chemicals, but the majority of fruit and vegetables sold in this country are still conventionally farmed. There is, however, a field of agriculture that is making big inroads into how farming is done. Regenerative agriculture, or Regen Ag, is transforming lives and li livelihoods. So, these are just some of the principles of regenerative agriculture. We'll talk a little bit about them. Um, indigenous cultures have known for a long, long time of the innate knowledge in many of the Regen Ag's techniques. These practices have existed for centuries, but the term itself has only been around for some decades, and as of late, has increasingly showed up in academic research since early to mid-2010 in the fields of environmental science, plant science and ecology. Alan Savory gave a TED talk on fighting and reversing climate change in 2013. He also launched the Savory Institute, which educates farmers on holistic land management. Abe Collins created Landstream to monitor ecosystem performance on regenerative agriculture farms. And Eric Tonesmeyer and countless others have published books on the subject. Robert Radal of the Radal Institute began championing the benefits of this type of agriculture as far back as 1971. So increasing diversity, not only in our plantings, which is such as using multi-species cover crops, which we'll talk about in the next bit, but in the wildlife and the insect populations and soil and all around. Nature has never worked in a vacuum and nature must have balance and she will work toward that balance at every opportunity. Nature wastes nothing. Everything in nature has a purpose and a role to play. Many weeds not only can tell us about the soil condition, but also about our management practices. For example, overstocking or poor management of grazing animals will have your ground laid bare and compacted. Erosion from wind and water, but nature will do everything in its power to heal and heal itself. This may be with the use of vegetation to reduce erosion and hold the soil together, or it may be in the use of vegetation that covers the soil and be begins the decompaction process. Nature has a language of her own. It is useful for us as gardeners and farmers to understand these patterns and learn how to read this language. Reading our landscapes is half the battle. But this is not taught in our schools or our garden books. It is a pattern of language that we must learn to read in order to work with nature. In regenerative terms, everything has a function and a place, and we can utilise these functions to help us restore and renew. Reducing tillage, 
No bare soil. Keep the ground covered. When the soil is bare and uncovered, it dries out and begins to form a crust. Carbon dioxide leaves the soil and we begin to bake the microorganisms that live within it. If left in this state, our soil is also prone to erosion from wind and water. The life of which, which lives in the soil, your microorganisms, need warmth and security that comes with a blanket of living plants. The best way we can achieve this is to keep the diversity in our cover crops. They may be forage crops or simply a meadow of flowering plants, but either way, we need to keep the ground covered. Living plants actually feed the system below ground and aid in the production and uptake of the very minerals and elements they need to support their growth. In some way, the plants are um, actively farming the soil microbes. There is a lot to learn about life in the soil, and Dr Elaine Ingham is probably the best known soil biologist for her work on the soil food web. She was able to explain that life lives within the soil and how it interacts with plants. Dr Christine Jones and Nicole Masters have taken it further into the, taken us further into these thriving metropolises beneath our feet. All agree that one critical aspect to regenerating the land and our ag agricultural systems is look after and care for your underground army. For they are the engine room of your crops and without them you simply have dead soil or dirt to be precise. I'm going to just ditch that now. <laughs> so um, reduced tillage, we know that when we turn up the soil it's adding air into the soil which can be a good thing but it's also chopping up our microbes, it's chopping up our fungi and our fungal webs and those things need to be left in the soil, not exposed. Um, restoring the water cycle, that comes when you restore, you're looking after your soil. It's only just recently been discovered that um, we know that plants photosynthesise, right? And they collect the sun, turn that sun energy into energy they need to grow and they feed that out as sugars in their root systems to the microbes in the soil. What's just recently been found is that soil with a healthy functioning microbial population can produce its own water. And um, there's some really interesting studies coming out on that. So we have what's called a large water cycle, which is what we all know as rain coming in off the ocean and dropping over land. And we also have a small water cycle. So that small water cycle is actually being pumped by your plants and your soil and your soil microbes. And it's that that we need to repair. Integrating pest management and holistic animal management, it's around looking at the systems and allowing nature to take its course. Um, I'll give you a quick little story which still blows my mind away. Who had snail problems last season? Everybody had snails, right? With all the wet. And I know that the local hardware store sold a lot of snail pellets, copper tapes, you name it. But we sat back and we waited and we picked up lots and lots of snails in buckets of water and fed them to the chooks and we did all of those things. Um, but I was sitting there one afternoon after some rain and I saw this unusual worm that I've never seen before. It was black and it had a blue stripe down its back. So I took a photo, I was quite excited. We got on t in touch with a biolo biologist friend and said, have you ever seen these things before? He said, oh yes, that's our native blue flatworm and they eat snails. So nature provided exactly what I needed to fix my snail problem. So if we just wait, she'll do all of that for us. Sequestering carbon in, into the soil and feeding the so soil food web, also most critical when you've got all those things happening, and Michelle said 
beautifully earlier, when you're looking after the soil, everything else will fall into place. So that's a multi-species cover crop. And can you see it? There's a lady beetle in there. That lady beetle will be looking for aphids. The ants farm them. So integrated pest management. So we've covered the soil. Reduce your chemical use, please, 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 please. It's just turning our plants into drug addicts. We don't need them. Reduce your tillage. That's called a um, yeoman's plough. It's three very deep tines and it's literally just slicing the, the ground rather than turning it over. Slicing the ground allows the air in and the water in without disturbing your, your bi biology. And we talked about the small water cycle already. And when you build diversity, it continues to build. That's some holistic grazing. And our carbon microbes and fungi all go together. Thanks. <laughs> Questions. Oops, sorry. We've probably got time for maybe one question if anybody's. Sure. Can you tell us any more about that small water cycle? Is it, is it just that the water's um, yep. drained in the, in, the, in the mulch? No. Just repeat the question. Yeah. So the question was tell us more about the small water cycle um, and if that water is retained in the mulch. So, yes, mulch will hold water, first and foremost. But no, that is. The small water cycle that I was talking about is the biology, and it's um, it's called hydrophotosynthesis. Um, you can look it up online. A fellow by the name of Ken Bellamy has written a white paper on it recently, back in 2018. And Walter Jenny from the ANU is an expert on that. Um, particular information. But basically the microbes and the fungi in the soil are literally by their own processes generating water. Is there any other one any other questions? No? Thank you very much. Thank you all. That was